All right. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the popcorn. F- <laughs> I feel I feel funny saying that because I'm not popcorn. <laughs> All right, whatever. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the popcorn for dinner tonight. Um, for pop to the popcorn for dinner podcast, we have kicked out Bankole from, you know. <laughs> from the situ- <clears throat> situation and we have taken over because it is Game of Thrones time. And as <laughs> huge Game of Thrones nerds and the Song of Ice and Fire nerds, we have decided that we will have this discussion and maybe if Uncle is good, we'll pull him in for another conversation down the line. Um, Potentially. But- Depends on how much he knows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'll buy him a copy of the book and give him like two weeks to read the whole thing and be caught off to yeah. date. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But yeah, we're going to be having a discussion on season one, episode one of the House of, of, of House of the Dragons, um, set in the world of, of of George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, just a prequel to the story that goes on in the original show. So obviously, none of the characters that we know and love are going to be in, you know, reprising any roles in this new se- um, season or series rather. Um, and you know, the dynamics will be be a bit different because you know this is obviously when the Targaryens were still in power, so. Um, this is not the same houses that were in power as you know that goes on when you know Jon Snow and Daenerys are you know being the badasses that they are. <clears throat> um, okay, let me look at my list. Oh, actually, you know, your list is more expansive, so let's start with yours. Yeah, so I think I think the 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 main thing or the first thing that sort of stands out to me is how the show makes an effort to ground us back in the world it's like okay it's been some time they acknowledge this it's been three years now since game of thrones ended so um that gives us a lot to to think about hopefully people's memories have been refreshed i had a lot of friends who were like they're not interested just because of the way game of thrones ended i wasn't sure that was necessarily fair but you know it is it is fair i guess because people can choose what they want to do and I think that those people should sort of give the show a chance because, as you said, this is set a long time before. We're talking about like maybe like 172, almost 200 years before all of this. So I think it's appropriate to kind of talk about how we got here, right? Yeah. So we know that um, the Targaryens were the last survivors of the Doom of Valyria, right? And how they did that, well, sure, it was through ships and dragons, but it was also through dreams. And I know we're going to talk about dreams at some point, but um, essentially, Denny's um, daughter of Enal Targaryen had a, a dream. She said that Valera was going to get into some cataclysmic shock and um, nobody believed her. Nobody believed the Targaryens. They left and they went to um, the Isle of Dragonstone all right off the coast of Westeros, which we've seen Daenerys go to as well. That's why that was her base in seasons seven and eight. So um, they get there, they're kind of sitting around trying to start a new life. And eventually the doom happens and they were like, oh my God, we were right. I mean, we, I know we thought we were right, but we didn't expect to be this right. And they're literally the only ones left, except they're not the only ones left because there was another um, Valyrian family that left and the the Valerians and they settled on the island of Driftmark and the Valerians are very interesting because they weren't dragon riders they are shipbuilders shipmasters as well they have a massive fleet bigger than anything you've ever seen in Game of Thrones in fact the um current head of of House Valerian Corlys who is on the small council black dude with blonde platinum blonde dreads (laughs) we see you we see you. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is actually the richest person in the realm, richer than Tywin ever was. Definitely richer than the Tyrells, richer than the High Towers for sure. So it's interesting, but because I know he has some ambition. But getting back to sort of the um, the chronology of things, they st- um, the Targaryens are on on Dragonstone for a little while. They sit there for maybe three generations or so, and then Aegon's born. And he's like, hey, there's like a whole continent over there. Let's go see what it looks like. So he gets on his dragon. His two sisters get on their dragons as well. And they do a little bit of a tour of the place. And they're like, oh, my God, these people are all idiots. Let's do it. Yeah. So so they take they, they decide that they wanted to kind of unite the kingdoms. 
but it wasn't just because um, he wanted to have the riches and glory. That was definitely part of it. He's the call. He's called the conqueror for a reason, right? But based on certain things that we hear in this episode and certain things that have been mentioned in other sources before, he also had a dream. And um, like I said, we'll talk about that dream in a bit, but he wanted to unite the, the kingdoms for a reason. So eventually, you know, everybody bends the knee to Aegon. They did not bend the knee to Daenerys. I guess she was less scary. But in the end, um, the kingdoms become one. Well, there's still seven, but they're one. And we actually see all the swearing of fealty in this episode. But as far as the dynasty is concerned, we know that Aegon was the first. After him was Ennis. After Ennis was Migor. And then after Migor was Jaehaerys, who we actually see at the beginning of the episode. He's called the old king. He became king maybe at the age of 14. Nobody ruled longer than him. He and his wife basically brought prosperity to the kingdom. They are the ones who created the king's road. She was his wife, actually, um, Alison. She was the one who um, basically equipped the Night's Watch. They created that little town near the wall that we see sometimes in Game of Thrones, which has fallen to ruin, by the way. These Night's Watch guys need to account for <laughs> some of the things that... But, <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> yeah, like... But, but yeah, um, it, they... She, I mean, she dies and he's the only one left. And we, we start to see the succession issues so one thing i find very interesting here is this show is kind of like game of thrones meets succession except that you know in succession they don't have dragons and they're not as good <laughs> because we have we, we have american law to deal with <laughs> but there is no american law here and you know they, they, they do have some laws but they kind of allow for some gleeful violence yeah. and um you know tensions are definitely high because they showed us at the beginning of the episode Viserys being chosen as the heir. But how do we get there? Jaehaerys actually and Alison actually had a lot of kids, maybe like 13 of them or something yeah. like that. And um, his first son, Aemon, he um, he had a brother. He, so there were two two main sons, I'm going to say, Aemon and I think it was Balon. And Aemon's daughter is... Um, is actually in the show. She is the other candidate for um, for the succession. Um, she's Corlys's wife, and she's called the queen who never was. And the issue there, at least the kind of the bone she has to pick with the family, is that, well, Jaehaerys passed, um, after Aemon died, he passed over her and went to Balon. Then Balon died, he passed over her again and went to Balon's son, um, Viserys. And that's because, you know, the lords of Westeros want to keep things um, the way that they like. They want only a, ma only a man to rule. They don't think women are capable. They don't think women should be allowed to have that kind of power. So that's how we get to where we are. And we've seen the saltiness that that creates. So when Viserys says, you know what, I want my daughter to rule. I should have been grooming you this whole time. We're all kind of happy. But I think on some level, as we're paying attention, we're like, hmm, this probably is going to cause some problems. <laughs> 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 and uh yeah that's that, that's essentially where where we're at now the whole conflict of this new series is based on everything that results from Rhaenyra being named as the heir so we'll see how things go yeah it's uh i, I agree with, with 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 all of that you know the targaryen you know one thing i do find very interesting is that you know when the targaryens eventually <clears throat> came to conquer westeros you know nobody could stop it in their way like the only how the, so there were seven kingdoms obviously and the only yeah. kingdom that was able and they to, were warring yeah seven kingdoms who were all fighting with each other and the targaryens basically came and took over six of the seven the only one they couldn't take over was dorn because the dornish people applied these guerrilla tactics built like different of years yeah <laughs> dorn, this game of thrones show did a very bad job of capturing how badass the dornish were and that's one of my it's insane with them. but the dornish are a badass house that re resisted the targaryen rule for over a hundred years before eventually joining the seven kingdoms by marrying, 
which is why the Dornish people kept our so-called princes and princesses. Yeah, and they never came by force. They were actually yeah. never, <laughs> they were never conquered. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the point I was trying to make is that the Targaryens, when they came to Westeros, were the biggest badasses of all time. But in Valyria, they were actually one of the smaller houses. They only had a few dragons, and they weren't competing with all the bigger houses. In fact, so the, the they were not at the top of the empire at all. Yeah, exactly. They were bottom feeders. And the stories that they, they tell is how the, the dreamer, I always forget her name. Um, Danies. Danies, thank you. Danies, yeah. the dr- dreamer, she, they say that she had the prophetic dream and that's why they left uh, Valeria. But there are also some sources in the world that George has created were like, no, they weren't, you know, wasn't a prophetic dream. They were exiled from Valeria and that's how they ended up on Dragonstone, you know? So it's it's just interesting how like, you know, in the world that George R. R. Martin has created, there's just different points of views on the same story. And you don't really know which one is the truth. There's all half truths everywhere. And, it's uh, interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. Because he uh, likes to create it. these different perspectives. Yeah. And um, I mean, even for the book Fire and Blood, like he has two sources. There's a, there's a septum called Eustace. <laughs> and then there's there's literally this this jester that's, um, <laughs> that, nobody, that nobody respects. And he, the jester's stories are all about like scandalous stuff. And then the septum is talking very like properly, but they're talking about the same things. You don't know who to believe. So I feel like yeah. in this show, we're going to be getting the somewhat objective version because they can only show one thing, right? So, yeah. but, and since George R. R. Martin is a creator of this show and he's part of the show running team, we thank God. Um, we're going to be <laughs> we're going to be seeing hopefully some accurate depictions of what actually yeah, happened. I know, but Loki, I do. I would love to see the jester's point of view because the jester, for people who haven't read the books, is something he's. He's a clown that just makes everything about sex and violence. It's almost like if you ever watch... For no session, reason. Yeah, there, there's a scene where Roman... He's like Roman. Like jerks off. He's literally like Roman. There's a <laughs> scene where Roman like jerks off in Jerry's bathroom and they're having breakfast the next day. And he's like, oh yeah, I jerked off in Jerry's bathroom last night. And everyone thinks, oh, this is obviously not true because like there's no way that happened. But like it actually happened. And that's kind of how I view the justice side of the story. But... um Regardless. Yeah, disbelief, man. Disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> He's just out here trolling people. But yeah, Aegon showed up with his his sisters and also his, his wives because he married his sisters, which is a theme yeah. on this show. Anytime I see like any incestuous thing, I'm going to point it out because the Targaryens are we mad should... incestuous. <laughs> yeah, and th- that, that actually even brings me back to the Valerians on some level because um, I think it's a cool choice in the show to make them, to make them black. But... And I, I I like it, but I don't like that they didn't think it through enough. I feel like I feel like they should have really committed to this idea, right? Because we see the children of um of Corlys and um what is his name, Rhaenys? Rhaenyra, the queen who never no no was. the queen who never was. was. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so she we see their kids and like obviously they are mixed, and that makes a lot of sense, right? But the thing is. The Targaryens are very particular about keeping their Valyrian blood in the family, mm-hmm. so that's that's actually the main reason that they were um, that they were having all these incestuous relationships. So whenever they could, they would marry a Valyrian. Um, in fact, Aegon the Conqueror, his mother was a Valyrian, so they would marry the Valyrians. And um, if they didn't have a Valyrian available to marry, they would actually just um, marry their sister, and that's how they kept that blood there. So the Valerians and Targaryens are this like sort of the this kind of incestuous group that's like one family in a sense because they've been marrying into each other for like at this point maybe centuries like at least two centuries so um it's cool that Corlys is black and everything but like the way they're showing it like I would have wanted them to think more about like you know stuff, stuff like the color of, of, of the hair I like that they chose somebody who's dark because in in truth, like anybody, like it will surprise you um, the kind of melanin that can come from different relationships. Like when a child is born, like I've seen people who are, um, who have two different, two parents of different races and they look exactly like one race that happens. I mean, for example, J. Cole, J. Cole (laughs) is actually half white and people don't know this because he's, he's clearly black, but he has a brother, like, a biological brother who you wouldn't know is his brother because that guy is white. So <laughs> stuff, stuff like that, stuff like that happens. And um, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because I really like that they've chosen to make them black. I know a whole bunch of people are probably going to complain about that. But, yeah. um, you know, we don't take unnecessary complaints over here. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I like that, um, that, they're, that they're 
kind of hinging on the whole Valeria thing. And I like that we're seeing that Corliss is very shrewd and that he doesn't have the patience for nonsense. Because yeah. I feel like somebody in his position, especially being black, <laughs> would, actually be so, would actually be so tired all the time. He's like, but you can see his face in these small council meetings. He's like, oh my God. Like, what am I dealing with here? You know, and yeah, I, I think I think we're we're in for for a good ride with that. Yeah, uh, I agree so too. I'm mean, very excited to see Corliss for that Valerian story because um, there there are some characters over the 300 years of the prequel to the Game of Thrones that kind of become you know legends. I'm talking like Sir Arthur Dane, Igor the Conqueror, you know, and um, the Sea Snake is one of those characters. So I'm very much looking forward. To, I'm kind of excited that there's a black man playing the Sea Snake. I didn't see that coming because the Targaryens are typically you know fair skin, you know, purple eyes or lilac eyes, you know, mm -hmm. blonde hair. So just to all of a sudden see a black man with dreads walking through, I was like, wow, let's go. That's and cool. the hair is naturally that color too. Yeah, like, yeah So it yeah. shows that they have that Valerian blood. So exactly there's, exactly, there's enough grounding in reality there for, for us to kind of accept it. I think anybody who has a real problem with it is probably just a bad villain, but <laughs> honestly, we'll honestly. see. <laughs> Well, yeah, very excited to see Corliss Valerian. Um, also very excited to see um Damon, um the tattered was it the tattered no, he's not the tattered prince, the Prince of Flea Bottom, is that what they called him? Prince of Flea Bottom, Prince of the yeah. City. Yeah, and I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm I'm glad I mean he's he's really cool and yeah, he's very volatile. Yeah. I when we look at what we saw of him in this episode, right? He has a whole bunch of, of things on his agenda, but and he's portrayed as this brute, but there's a lot going on in in his mind and i like that a lot because he well first of all they're trying to get rid of him right they want him to they want him to be able to i guess for lack of a better term they want him they want him to to kind of stay subdued um you saw like when Viserys was talking about how they wanted him to do this thing they don't want him to do that thing they wanted like, eventually they said okay let's make him commander of the city watch which actually is is an interesting historical thing because um in the in the original series we see um the city watch quite a lot so we see them working with Tyrion in season two for example Janna Slint is their commander he ends up on the wall and they're called the gold cloaks um Daemon was actually the one who gave the city watch of King's Landing their gold cloaks. So he is the reason they're called the gold cloaks. Um, as the narration um, says at the beginning, you know, this is, it's been about a century now since the Targaryens have ruled. Viserys the first is the fifth Targaryen king. So that tells you just how far ahead of Game of Thrones we are um, in terms of the chronology, because um, Daenerys' dad, the Mad King, Ares II, he is the 17th Targaryen king. So we have a long ways to go before we get to what was happening in the original show. And I like that they're tying things together as well with the um, the Dream of the Winter. I mean, what were your thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> so dreams are obviously a huge recurring part of, you know, the whole Game of Thrones universe. We, we talk about like Daenerys in season two in the House of the Undying when she had her prophetic dreams of the future. Uh, we're thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously we're factoring all the black magic, like Melisandre and things like that. You know, dreaming is just a huge part of the Game of Thrones um, ethos. But when I initially saw that scene, because that scene is not something that we've ever seen before in any of the books or any of the supplementary material. So <clears throat> on one hand, I thought it added a bit of like, a, a, a change that I didn't like to Aegon the Conqueror storyline. It felt weird all of a sudden thinking about Aegon just wanted to conquer all the kingdoms just so that he could protect the world from, you know, no, Aegon was a conqueror. He just wanted to take over shit. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Well, I mean, at least that's how he has been portrayed up until now. So initially I had this exactly. knee jerk. Oh, I, I don't like that change um, storyline. But then I thought about it and, you know, I was like, maybe I'm just like, being a big gatekeeper to ask what, you know, no, the book didn't say that, so you mustn't do that. And then I realized that, you know, this exact same dream that we talked about was also discussed in Game of Thrones. Um, so Mr. Eamon, if you remember, Mr. Eamon was the maester at, at um, Castle Black. Um, and yes. he was actually a Targaryen. And his, he was... He also could have been the king. That's a long He chose story. not to be. But yeah, he chose the whole thing. We'll, we'll get into that another time. <laughs> yeah, but he could have been king. And it's talked about in Game of Thrones, but he chose not to be king and to basically make his brothers rule um, as 
as straightforward as possible so people don't like use them to play off each other for more power. He left for the Night's nice Watch. Now his brother ends up obviously becoming a king. His name is Aegon the Unlikely. I think it was Aegon the Fourth, but yeah, we call fifth. him Egg Fifth. Aegon the Fifth, but we yes. call him Egg for short. Uh, oh, fourth was Aegon the Unlikely, um, the Unworthy. Right, the debaucherous one. Oh my yeah. goodness, <laughs> that's another colorful character. But Egg was uh. basically um, um, they became the king, and by the time Egg is king, the Targaryens have been through a lot, and um, he has perfected dreams about this, you know, savior Azor High who will be born from his line, and that was one of the factors that made him shape things that ultimately, through not through his faults, but would lead to the downfall of House Targaryen in. The ways of the Mad King, because the Mad King married his sister, and that marriage was forced yeah. upon him by his dad because he saw a prophetic dream about how their offspring will save the world. So you know, and that offspring and it, ended up being like Jon Snow, I guess. But you know, yeah, and it's 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 weird because it, we we see we see this whole like incestuous thing that we've discussed, right? But the funny thing is, Egg, um, Egg on the fifth, he actually wanted to stop the incest. He married outside of the family and he, you know, it, it, they want, it became this whole obsession with the self-fulfilling prop prophecy. I mean, Viserys says in this episode that dragons are actually a power that man should never have trifled with. And they kept trifling with it. They had some really weird people in this family. There's this one guy called Arian who thought drinking wildfire would make him a dragon. I can tell you for a fact it did not. <laughs> and... <laughs> And now, you know, we get to the point where Aegon V is on the throne. We have the tragedy of Summer Hall, which happens. We don't know actually what went on there, but I have a feeling they were trying to hatch dragon eggs because the place burned down. And that's how the like the last people in the line died. So you have just um, Aegon's son, Jaehaerys. Um, he survives. And Jaehaerys was, you know, he... Aegon, like I said, wanted to stop the incest. So he wanted his son, Jaehaerys, to marry outside the family. But Jaehaerys and his sister were in love. So they married despite Aegon's best wishes. Then Aegon dies. It's like, well, nobody's there to stop us now. So they get married. They have Ares. They have Ares' sister, Rhaella. Um, and then they get married, even though they did not like each other at all. And then from that union comes Rhaegar, Viserys, who would have, in this case, been Viserys III if he was king and um Daenerys and of course John who also come, who's also there and we have this whole thing about the prince that was promised um that that it started from from that because Aegon the fifth has a similar dream so I like that they kind of tied that really well together here I mean yeah. the, the cool thing about it is one of my favorite things about that prophecy is it could have been any of these people we didn't know who it was going to be Rhaegar thought it was yeah. himself yeah. right and then he realized it would be his son. And that's why he became so obsessed with having more children. He, his marriage to um, Ilya Martel was not the greatest. Um, he didn't spend much time with her. They did have two kids. And one of those kids was actually named Aegon. But of course, they were all murdered by the mountain. So Rhaegar is so obsessed with fulfilling this. Yeah, he's so obsessed with fulfilling this prophecy that he has another kid with a Stark, right? And names that kid Aegon again. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like, okay, I, I see what you're trying to do here, but calm down at least. I mean, when when they were going to reveal Jon Snow's um, Targaryen name, his actual name in the show, I had my bets on like on his name being Jaehaerys or something like that. I thought, yeah, okay, really? maybe, yeah, I, I thought maybe his name would be because I thought that would be a cool name. It would be it would be a callback to a king who was known for being great. Yeah. You know, um, and maybe 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 Ned Stark wanted to maybe he just he shortened it. He like derived the name John from Jaehaerys because yeah. that's like a yeah. good crossover. But um, in the end, his name was Aegon because alas, um, Rhaegar is obsessed with prophecy. Um, and I think there could have been so much that came from that in the original series. They could have explored the whole thing about John and Daenerys' relationship being complicated by this factional behavior. It probably could have resulted in another dance to dragons if John was interested. Yeah. But then he wasn't interested, and that's something worth exploring as well. But yeah, we all know how that went narratively in the show. <laughs> so, oh well. Uh, that is character assassination. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Loki. It's like I, again, I'm I, I'm not obviously, I'm not salty about Danny going Mad Queen, but 
it could have been done better. Like, it makes sense, and I can see it. And people have been talking about it possibly for years, but the way it was done was just like, no, that makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, I'd say I'm, I'm very happy to see Rhaenyra in this show because I always liked her. Yeah. And it's fair to say Rhaenyra walked so Daenerys could run, right? And I guess, you know, ultimately fall. But she is like, if you take Daenerys and... And like mix that character with like Arya. Arya, yeah. Honestly, I, I I understand why people say, oh, she's like Daenerys, but to me, she's not like Daenerys. She's not like Arya. Daenerys at all. She's literally She's Arya. more of an Arya. She's Arya. Yeah. Like, I love like like if she's basically like if, if if Arya Stark was a Targaryen, what would that look like? That's how yeah, you get literally that's how you get Emery. You just swap out Nymeria, like uh, Arya's direwolf for um for Cyrax. Yeah, for Cyrax. And then yeah, that's literally it. Because she's a very willful, very, you know, strong character who is like, you know, in the same way Arya is, you know, she does, she wants to learn about the world around her. She wants to, you know, she doesn't want to just sit down and like do court like how Sansa wanted to when she was younger. You know, from a young age, she was always willing to go the extra mile. She was just very willful, very strong. I, I love that character. Very, very good character. And I'm very excited to see Millie, Al Rock, and Emma Darcy, you know, um, embody these characters because if you've been following anything about the casting news there are two actors playing this one character so that makes you believe that this is going to happen over a longer time span so obviously we know how the story of the dance of dragon ends but we're not discussing spoilers but you know the fact that there are two characters playing this one person over a long period of time should let you know that this isn't you know over in two three years in 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 the lives of the character this is going to you know stretch over a long period of time and um some mm-hmm. some of the kid actors would be you know, performed by older actors, and you know that's going to be exciting. And I'm very excited to see how that you know how that shapes up. I wonder if people are going to be comparing who was better, the younger or the older actor, for each of the characters that are aged. They they older. might be. I I like that it's turning into an an origin story, really, because what what we've seen in this first episode and maybe even parts of the second, this is really an origin story because the main. The main conflict, as you know, has not started yet. <laughs> there are things that there are things that are going to happen. And there are people that are going to come into the play in, into play that the show hasn't even mentioned. Yeah. I love how like I'm watching these trailers and there are certain people that I've not seen. I'm like, wow, you guys are frauds. <laughs> you guys are frauds. How are you doing this? And you know, honestly, you know, I love it. I I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. I accept. So like yeah. I mean, even I, I know what you said about swapping out in America for, for, for Cyrax. I mean, that's an interesting idea because like, you know. The, the Targaryens are at the height of their power here. You know, like, we're five generations into the monarchy now. There is wealth. There's power. I mean, Fire and Blood, the book, refers to the reign of Viserys as the apex of Targaryen power and wealth. The economy is booming. We can see dragon effigies everywhere. They're tangible reminders of the symbolic power and dynastic control of this family. I mean, there are clearly still problems, and we see all of that in the headaches that come with running the city. But, you know... We, that reminds us of the small council meetings of like early Game of Thrones, like season one, season two, yeah. how these guys were actually concerned with the minutia of making things work. But the biggest thing here is these dragons. And we see how like the dragons are literally like part of society in a sense. Like people are, have, have accepted that they're there, they're scared of them. But that's the, as, the, as Rhaenyra says, that's the source of their power because that's the reason nobody will mess with them. Right. Like we see that the I mean, I think in in the course of the story, there may be there are at least 17, 20 dragons. I mean, they're everywhere at this point. Daenerys had three, which was even a lot, because at the time Daenerys was born, at the time her her dragons came to be, dragons hadn't actually been seen maybe for about 150 years because, um, you know, after the things that go on here, you know, things become very complicated for the Targaryen family. And we see how they use these dragons. You know, they mount them with saddles, which I don't know why Daenerys never had a saddle. <laughs> Honestly, you know, we knew in the books that they, had, <laughs> the, the, yeah, we knew in the books that they that they mounted them with saddles, and we can see that here. But Daenerys was like, no, I'm just going to cling to scales. I'm like, all right, <laughs> if you fall, shall but no problem. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's reflective of how integrated they were into the daily life, a part of, as part of the family, as part of the show's reality. You know, as well as, you know, them being weapons of mass destruction because yeah. they're difficult to control. Like, 
the Targaryens, like, Viserys alludes to the fact that they are not really in control of the dragons. Like the dragons are still unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, I think viewers tend to assume that they would not harm certain people. They wouldn't harm Targaryens, but they can like, yeah. yes, they say fire cannot kill a dragon, but I'd say still beware, which is one of the reasons, again, I'm, I'm really worried for those guys that are wrangling the dragons. <laughs> Every time I see them, I'm just like, bro, how Man. did you get here? Like, and you're so confident about this. You're here speaking Valeria to this dragon. Like, I, I genuinely thought like somebody was gonna die. <laughs> like, I mean, so, I think I, I don't even. I, somebody's gonna ask. One of those people are gonna ask. I hope they have good insurance or something, man. So because when they die, their family needs to be taken care of. <laughs> insurance, as if they to take care of peasants. You know how they are. I mean, yeah. Viserys even has other things on his mind. You know, like yeah. I know George R. R. Martin said that he's he's really impressed by, um, the way. Paddy Consident is portraying Viserys. And I like it a lot too, because Viserys in the book is not that interesting. Mm. He's a guy who wants to have a good time. Sure, he wants to, I mean, there's this decadent wealth, there's enjoyment. Even where like um, Emma, his wife, is giving birth in this episode, you can see that tapestry on top. It's like a lot of crazy stuff going on on top of that bed in that picture. Yeah. And, you know, he. I think Paddy Consident gives th this character like... Um, this real depth i know george armand said it's kind of like a tragic majesty and yeah. i don't think the book viserys ever really achieved that and i think that's yeah. that that's very cool but speaking of the acting i was going to ask you how do we feel about the wigs in this show because uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't i don't know yet i don't know i'm I don't I, know I, i'm just looking but i like the one on rainera but i don't know Rhaenyra's honestly wig looks great daenerys's looks wig is still top notch that still yeah. that managed to look to look real every single time. I'd say no matter what they really did with her hair. But some yeah. of the people in this in this show so far, I don't know. I I think I'm okay for the most part. I think it starts. I become a little iffy when it comes to Viserys. Yeah. But when it comes to Rennie's, his cousin Corlys's wife, I'm like, yeah. what is going on on your yeah. head right now? I don't know like why they styled the hair like that. Uh, I don't know. It's it's all weird. But Viserys, though, he's like you said, he was like a very amiable king. Mm. He was um, he was he's what I call a peacetime king. So his father, not his father, his grandfather, Jaehaerys, his grandfather, king, yeah, <clears throat> who was king before him, was you know arguably one of the best, most prosperous kings in you know the several kingdoms, and he was able to be a very set peacetime the tone, king. Yeah. He set the tone for like what should have been like generation who was successful leadership because he was good he was he took over from a tyrant and was able to stabilize things you know this might not mean anything but he disarmed the faith militants and the faith militants are the ones who were who made Cersei do the walk of shame so he's the reason why they were not in power because they used to be a big problem and he's the reason why they huge were problem and Migor likes them right yeah I yeah. mean it, it shows it shows that duality because I mean yeah. Aegon had those two sisters that were his wives um his favorite his favorite sister i think i think visenia was his favorite visenia. no it was no 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 visenia was, was the, the other was one mom yeah i always forget her name yes so i think yeah. i think her name was was it Rainey's, i, mean, I think i think her name, i think them. i think her name was actually was actually rainy's and Rainey's, she was yeah. his favorite i think she gave birth to um to Annie's, who is Rainey's, yeah and is the first and he is actually the person that all the other monarchs are descended from because yeah. after Ennis died, you know, Mego took over and he didn't actually have any descendants. He's called Mego the Cruel for a reason. He built Mego's hold fast within the Red Keep, that castle within a castle that we see Cersei hiding in in season two during um the battle for for uh of Blackwater. And you know, I, I just I, I I think I think about that duality of of, of like of that family what would have happened if Migor was there um what i don't think i mean we'd definitely have a different series but Ennis was, con was considerably a weak person so you had all that duality that de harris then inherited like you said and then he takes it and he's like okay i'm going to make this place prosperous and thank goodness he was around for a long time yeah. because because yeah he 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 sort of um like you said set the tone and he wanted to keep that like he knew that okay if i don't do this council there's going to be a bloody battle for succession yeah. here because i can see tensions are high he wanted yeah. to avoid it but i guess people just can't really escape their nature because they really 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 want to fight yeah <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah so we'll see we'll see we'll see where, where, where that takes us hopefully things don't get too too bloody i suppose but 
But speaking of like hot blooded people, what do we think of Damon? I like I like Damon. I like the I like Matt Smith portrayal of, of portrayal of Damon. I feel like that guy's so good, right? He's Matt good. Smith. He's good. Like I'm I'm talking like he's like Jamie Lannister good. Like that kind of character where you're like, yeah, this guy can do some evil things, but you still like him for whatever reason. You know, he's exactly. endearing. He's I like Damon. I'm very very excited. I think so. The two characters that I'm most excited to explore are Minira and Damon, like at least who are in episode one. There's some other characters. There's Kristen Cole, who I'm excited about his future. There's the the Sea Snake, who I'm mm-hmm. excited to see how they're portrayed. But there is um, the Hightower woman. What's her name? Um, Alice um, Alice Hightower? Is... Yeah, those, those are like the characters who I'm very interested to, out of the ones who've been introduced to us. But, you know, Damon is, yeah. uh, he's top of that list. He's he's up there because he's a really good character. He, he really goes through a yeah. journey in this series, doesn't yeah. he? Because what you think, yeah. you think about like where he is like now and some stuff about where he's going to be. And, yeah. you know, he, I, I like how, you know, just like with the Starks and their, and their dire wolves, these dragons are kind of sort of reflections of their writers. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, Rhaenyra has been writing since I think she was nine. Um, and she's, so she's, she's really, really like good at this. Like she has a bond with this dragon. I think it's very similar for Demon with his dragon, Caraxes, who yeah. we see. And he's kind of, I mean, Caraxes is clearly like, he he's described kind of as a, as a rabid dog, so to speak, you know, and I think I think that's kind of interesting because, you know, he he reflects Damon's like ferociousness in a way, and um, I think we see that his neck is really really long. Apparently, he's yeah. kind of deformed. You know, he has a long neck. He has these tiny wings on his legs as well. He's really really fast, and um, there's going to be a lot that that we'll see coming from from the conflict before I, uh, before this the show ends. Yeah. Um, Damon himself, obviously, he can't hold his tongue. He <laughs> considers himself the Cerys' heir, and you know, I mean, the whole thing about him calling his actual wife in the veil his bronze bitch, like that's a real thing. That's from the source material, and I cannot <laughs> believe these guys. I was like, not these guys honoring this specific. <laughs> like, of all the things you could adapt, like uh, that's just interesting to me because yeah. I mean, he's kind of brutal and he loves it. I mean. He loved being part of the the city watch. He loved commanding them, like cutting the hands off pick pickpockets. I mean, we see like the brutality of what they were doing to those people that night, just because, yeah. like that was actually quite a lot. Um, I mean, he wields Dark Sister as well, the same sword that was that was wielded by, um, by Visenya, um, who who yeah, rode with Aegon the first. Yeah, and you know his other wife Rhaenys had her own sword, but like you know, his Valyrian steel is being passed down in in this family. Aegon's sword. Um, it's also being passed, and I think that's the one the king uses. But it's it's really it's really fun to see all these little um, references in there. Um, but yeah. but yeah, like the the show is so visceral with this um, with with the violence. How are you yeah. feeling about that? I mean, I'm here for it because, like, at the end of the day, so when you know the Game of Thrones uh, um, original uh, eight seasons came out, the Targaryens were you know no longer in power. They were it was only Danny and Viserys left, and you know before long it was Viserys, obviously, and Jon Snow. But the, what this show is going to like show us, and what I'm excited to be is to to see is why the Targaryens were badasses. Why for 300 years these motherfuckers ruled everything, and like no one could challenge them because they were that badass. They were literally the pinnacle of everything, and they had dragons, and they were ruthless. You know, I mean. Obviously, someone like Viserys, it's not obvious with him because he's more of a, you know, he's an amiable um, character. He's a friendly king, blah, blah, blah. He wants to please people. But, you know, there were some ruthless Targaryens. And uh, Daemon, obviously, is showing the inklings of being one of the more, like, if you mess with me, I will kill you kind of people. And he has a dragon who, you know, will do the exact same thing. So I'm I'm yeah. here for all of it, all the violence, all the, all the you know, plotting. And, you know, something else I love is that, so in Game of Thrones, there was, it was such a huge story. And by like season two, you know, Arya was in um, Essos, which is a, like another part. Of this, um, Daenerys was all the way in, in um, you know, Marine and all those other slaver cities. You know, John was going north of the Wall, so the story was very spread out. In this series, it's all centered around King's Landing for the most part. It's gonna grow, it's mm-hmm. gonna expand a bit because the Targaryens are the house of power, and the show is kind of about them. And they are situated in Dragon in King's Landing, which is the capital. So yeah, you might see some other houses, some other places like Dragonstone come into play. But because of the story is just a lot more compact because it's about the Targaryens, 
politics is very contained here. Yeah. Politics is very self-contained, and it leads for a lot of the the political maneuverings that we came to know and love from the first two or three seasons of Game of Thrones, where like you know you're dealing with the White Walkers who are cool, you know, but you know you're you're worried about those minute political plays, you know. You know, it's like Barry's little finger all over again, and I'm, I'm just here for it. And and those are the things that we loved about Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Like people interacting with each other, trying to figure things out. I mean, season two was so great. Just just all that nonsense of like Tyrion doing what he was doing, playing yeah. playing with people's minds, like yeah. that was great. And you know, Jaehaerys knew it's something that I've always been saying. I mean, because these people are untouchable. They're yeah. seen, you know, Rhaenyra's, um, Rhaenyra actually, you know echoes that sentiment that they are seen as closer to God than men. I mean, they look different. They're built different. They um, they feel different to speak to. I mean, how, like, it, it's the, the way I, I've always put it. It's like when I'm talking to people about them, it's, it's kind of like, like, it's a question of how do you, how do you destroy something that's supposedly an unstoppable force? Like, how do you destroy an unstoppable object? And usually the answer is from within by its own hand, right? Mm-hmm. And they echo that when they say, um, the only thing that Jaehaerys knew, the only thing that could destroy the Targaryens was themselves. Yep. And, you know, you know, it was cool to hear that in the first few moments of the show. Speaking of which, um, narration is an interesting um, storytelling device that they're using here. Um, mm-hmm. Game of Thrones never wanted to do that. I'm wondering if they'll use other, you know, devices, like maybe flashbacks. Um, kind of like, I feel like if they did, they would do it similar to how it's done in The Crown, which is, by the way, an excellent series. Everybody should go watch that. But yeah. Um, where they go, where they jump back and forth in time, but I don't think that, that would necessarily be be the move. I think from what we've seen, they're kind of just going in chronological order, doing it like you know, sh- showing these people as they grow into the people who actually embody that conflict. Yeah. And um, and yeah, like with 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 the with the dream, uh, there's so much. I mean, I I'd say Viserys's first dream that he mentions. Um, about his son taking the throne. I mean, that's such a vivid, uh, it's such like it's such a vivid and indulgent fantasy of like just grandeur and majesty that yeah. I'm like, bro, you are really counting your chickens before they're really hatched hard here, here, literally. Because <laughs> how are you here having a tournament to the birth of your new heir? Kid hasn't been born yet. Your yeah. wife is not doing that great, but you're not yeah. checking in on her. Because no. you're not very smart, are you, no. Viserys? I, I'm disappointed in you, Viserys. <laughs> because then you're like, okay, you have to make this difficult choice now. You want all of her labor to have been for something, and then she ends up dying, and then yeah. obviously the child dies too. He names the child yeah, after yeah. his father. That yeah. child dies. It's, it's a it's a whole thing. And now I don't know, like what what we what were you thinking re- regarding like that dream, the indulgence, and even. Even the the dream that he tells Rhaenyra about, like I know you have like a whole bunch of things probably about the the dreams. Yeah, I mean, so with 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 the dream about his son, you know, being born, I, you know, for me, Viserys, he's like a, he's not a bad king, but he's just not a strong good king. He's like kind of a spoiled kid, so it's like yeah, he's gonna be expecting his child. To he's born like a sensible Robert. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, Robert, Robert, Robert. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it's like he's not uh, Robert. Is this water guy? But he's not like <laughs> it's like he's he just expects that everything's gonna work out. And you know, growing mm-hmm. up because his grandfather was such a good king, like things would work out. And he got used to just seeing not like it's like when you you don't go to the gym but you want to come out you know shredded. You know, no, you have to put in time. You have to put in work. And like for him, he's seen his dad his grandpa just do everything and everything works out but he never saw all the sweat blood and tears that went in on behind the scenes to make that work so he just expected yeah she's gonna give birth everything's gonna be fine because everything is always fine but it wasn't fine and um you know he definitely jumped the gun with um that tourney you know but i did like the tournament though it was like I'm, i mean i never really cared about jousting but i even felt some like they made they made it look cool they made jousting yeah. look actually yeah. interesting. Jousting, jousting is not supposed to look that fun yeah. let me just tell you it looks now. so Everybody intense <laughs> i was like yo did he did that guy die because i remember the jousting yeah. scenes from like season one and season two when the man and the Houghton and the mal you know play game ball where they almost fought you know in robert's tournament and it didn't look that cool yeah but this one looked it, intense the camera angles yeah. the shots the horses riding up I like how they showed the, like, the, just just the real indulgence in violence because these are 
these are crazy things. It's kind of like a controlled mosh pit in a sense. Because fight, <laughs> cause, cause fights can break out in jousting and like nobody is stopping it because yep. that's part of what these people came to see. Yep. And everybody sitting there is somewhat high born, most of them anyway. And, you know, like I said, the series is visceral. Like just these tactile depictions of motion and contact to the well-directed and very ghastly violence, you know, like the believable reactions to it as well. Like yeah. even to the more true to life portrayal of childbirth, like all this stuff is going on. I mean, that juxtaposition between the tournament violence yeah. and the and the childbirth, you know, like yeah. I think that ties that visual element um, in a knot that really establishes the tone of the series. And I wonder if we have Miguel Sapochnik to to thank for that because you know he's one of the showrunners. He he's a huge. Um, He's, he's, a, he's a hugely achieved um, and accomplished filmmaker. I mean, he directed some of our favorite episodes from the original series. He was very good at the battle episodes. He did yeah. Battle of, of the Bastards. He did the battle for um, for Blackwater. Did he do um, the, um, Hard Home? I think, I think he might have done Hard Home too, but I'm not yeah. sure. I think he may have done the battle for Castle Black. He did the battle for um, Castle too. He did all the big battles, I think, actually. Yeah, because that, that was like his... Um, that was his. That was his. His forte. I'm gonna yeah. say, and 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 actually, yeah, you're right. He definitely did hard home. I can't see that being like that. It fits his territorial yeah, yeah, language. Yeah, exactly. It does. And and I mean, I think the, the one thing I was wondering though, like, is this too much? Because this is episode one, right? And the kind yeah. of, the violence we're seeing here is actually really, really like it's kind of thing that you feel as you're watching it, right? Yeah. So I mean, when we see. When we see the jousters like get up and like they start fighting because they don't like the results and like people yeah. are literally like dying over there yeah um you know is it even possible for people to be put off by this display like i mean is there such a thing as too violent in the world of ice and fire like how do you think viewers are going to see this i think that anyone who is watching this has well not everyone but a lot of the people who are watching this have already seen game of thrones and we've seen a mm -hmm. lot of violence in game of thrones we've seen reek which was a very very like every time i watch a reek scene reek is theon Greyjoy when he gets captured by ramsey bolton <laughs> we've seen ramsey bolton okay like we're ready for this and we're here for it we know what we're signing up for so it's like you know if you're squeamish and you're not ready for like the level of violence that's gonna you know be portrayed in the show then maybe you should watch it because it gets like I don't want to say it gets better or it gets worse, but it just stays true to what Game of Thrones is. There's always going to be violence. There's always going to be conflict. There's always going to be sex. There's always going to be dragons and political maneuvering, quick, witty one-liners. Yeah. You know, it's all it's all going to be there. And again, this, this is a time of indulgence. This yep. is a time where, like, yep. these people are at the height of their power, like we said. And, you know, there's just... The, it's kind of like the the budding of a city. Like, King's Landing is starting to now really mature as a city. It's been around for roughly 100 years now some stuff is still being constructed i mean so you you can see that society is really is is, is really kind of adapting to itself so to speak like they've accepted that they're dragons the city watch now exists to keep the peace um because like it's still a fairly new thing at this point and of course yeah. people are still afraid of of the dragons speaking of which i'm i think it was very cool to see the dragon pit in full commission yeah, yeah yeah um i've i really really enjoyed like one thing i liked about the end of season seven of game of thrones was when they had i mean the actual meeting and the logic of the things that were said there uh, but <laughs> but but having having them actually have that meeting in the dragon pit was very cool because that's a building that hasn't been used for maybe like a century and a half. You know, yeah. we saw like these skulls of dragons on the ground and there's a whole bunch of stuff that resulted in the dragon pit not being used that we will not talk about today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but it was very nice to see that. And, you know, shout out to the dragon wranglers. Um, I, hope <laughs> they I, hope they, I hope the show runners don't kill you for fun, but... But I mean, th these dragons, we're, we're going to see more of them. Um, Beleriand the Black Dread, the dragon who was ridden by Aegon, biggest dragon in recorded history, as far as we know, um, at least um, as far as the Targaryens are concerned. You know, we've that's the dragon whose skull we see um, under the, the Red Keep, where like, you know, sometimes you, you see people having meetings in, in Game of Thrones under the Red Keep. Um, like in the crypts where like they have um I know whether it's like scheming, sometimes it was Tyrion, sometimes it was like Kyburn. Yeah. I know when Kyburn was testing out that scorpion and showing it to 
um, to Cersei, that huge dragon head that um, that he shot, that's Balerion's head. And we actually see Balerion's head again in this episode yeah. um, with the fire yeah. around it. It was huge. Um, and that, it, I, it looked even bigger than it did in the show. It just tells yeah. you how big this dragon was. That's was just his head, right? Yeah. Uh, Viserys, the first, um, the king in this episode, mm-hmm. he actually rode that dragon. Um, he was the one who um, who mounted um, Balerion. And ever since Balerion died, like, he didn't really take another dragon. You know, so, like, the biggest dragon now is... Um, that's still alive is Vagar, the one who was ridden by Visenya, as Arya Stark so precociously told us in in um, in, game, in early Game of Thrones, and um, you know Vagar is is the biggest is the biggest one and the the strongest I'd say the oldest dragon because these things can live for up to a hundred years clearly you know they live they live even longer than that depending on how things go and they never they never actually stop growing yeah so keep, as long as they keep eating they just keep getting oh my god Did, okay the more we're just talking about <laughs> this i'm feeling for the dragon pit okay which would you rather exactly be? would you rather be a dragon wrangler or, uh, or a nice watch brother Ooh. wow that is that is deep <laughs> <laughs> that is deep so let's see that one coming. Um, okay, I think, I think I'd probably be a dragon wrangler. Yeah. Because, uh, well, the dragons, the dragons are scary, but they're probably pretty interesting to be around. I, I mean, it, it's it's a huge job to kind of take care of those things. Hopefully, you can form, you can kind of form bonds with them too. They come to. I mean, even even the most ferocious dog will will still hold off before it hurts the person who's trying to feed him, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, I, it, it's kind of an interesting world. It's like it's a very like specific job that only a few people are capable of doing, and you know, you still get to go home and have a family <laughs> at the end, hopefully. Um, whereas with the Night's Watch, you're not no, you're not you're not really getting support. <laughs> at, least not at, at least not at the time of Game of Thrones. At this point yeah. in the series, the Night's Watch is actually still very well equipped. I don't know if we'll ever get to see them in this show, but they're they're doing a lot, and um, and yeah, I think I, I think that that whole um, the the tone of like what it means to do specific jobs, what it means to have specific roles, I think that's really reflected in the conflicts in a good way. Um, I actually really like that throne room scene between Viserys and, and Daemon towards the end of the episode. Yeah, I loved you know, it. Where I loved it. That it, it read practically like poetry. You know, he's yeah. like, "Oh, the blood of the dragon runs deep." It's like, "Then why did you cut me so deep?" It's like, "Wow!" I'm just like, oh, "Dang, bars, dang, bars." <laughs> That's some gangster shit, <laughs> right? I mean, it was it was really uh, fun, and you know, even with the design of the scenes, you know, kind of cutting away and not immediately showing us who won that joust between Kristen Cole and Damon. I thought that was a nice choice, yeah. you know, and juxtaposing that with the childbirth scene was also something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that was cool. And even just the way they do juxtapositions throughout the episode, I think is very fun. I mean, Mark Mylod, who does a lot of successions direction, yeah. was also um, a big director on Game of Thrones. And he's, I, I don't know if he's going to be working in this show too. This at first episode was, Directed by Miguel, which I think is is a great choice, um, but just the the duality that they kept showing is is a fun thing because duality is a real big um, theme in this in, in this prequel. At least I think it's going to be, you know, juxtaposing that swearing of fealties of the of the High Lords with Daemon's preparation for departure and Viserys telling Rhaenyra that she will become his his heir. I think that was an excellent touch. Yeah. You know, cutting from Viserys talking about the the long night, that the new long night that's going to come with the terrible winter, and that's when they they cut from there to you know Rickon Stark at the oh, time yeah. swearing his own yeah. allegiance. So yeah. we know that you know the Starks are here, um, the High Towers are here, like all the lords are still here. I mean, Harrenhal definitely still exists. I mean, that's where they did that council. Jaehaerys mm-hmm. called everybody to Harrenhal, and big um, enough for everyone. <laughs> ex- exactly, and you know they did a lot of attorneys at Harrenhal, um, even right up until the point where the Mad King was was, was around. It was it was a place for all kinds of gatherings. Yeah. And the place has always looked ruined. And it was dragons that did that. It's kind yeah. of a reminder from, from Tangeret's point of view. is like, we destroyed this place because the guy who was here annoyed us and he was dumb. 
and we're now going to use it as our place for parties. If you don't like that, <laughs> it's, not, it's not an issue. <laughs> uh, and interestingly enough, that's where, um, to step away from like um, House of the Dragon into Game of Thrones, that's where um, Rhaegar and, um, what's her name, Stark? Um, Lyanna. Lyanna Stark. That's where they met. There was at a tournament at there. Yeah. And there's this whole thing about the Knights of the Laughing Tree. It's like a whole thing. Yep. But that's where they basically yep. meet. So it's like, it, Harren Hall is a ruin, but it's a ruin that has played such an important, you know, role in all the years of the Westeros history, you know, just by the settings um, and as, as a huge setting point because it's the only castle big enough for like, I think a million people. I don't know. It's like really big though. But yeah, what do you think yeah. about the music? Uh I was just about to. I, I was just <laughs> thinking about that as as you asked me that because yeah. God answers prayer. Right? <laughs> one of my ma- one of, one of my main prayers, my wishes for this series was that they would please, please, please get Ramin Javadi to keep I doing mean, the music. Yeah, yeah. Ramin is the unsung, like pun intended. He is the unsung hero of Game of Thrones as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Yeah. And, like th- he's the ki- he's he's the king of light motifs. Like this yeah. man knows how to write a theme song. And I don't just mean like the main title theme. I mean Everything. he writes themes Everything. for ideas. He writes themes for characters, and you can see things weaved in. Like I could talk about the music in Game of Thrones like for like hours, honestly, yeah. because it's so detailed. The way the way he he merges ideas and like he's using this sound to tell you a story. Like sometimes you're seeing something in front of you, and then there's a twist that comes up later. You watch that scene again, and you hear that music is like they were telling you from the beginning yeah. something was wrong here. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, in, and, the, the yeah. perfect example for me is Cersei's when Cersei blows up the the Red Keep. The music yes. from that whole scene, the Light of the Seven. Oh my God, that Light of the Seven song so, is crazy. The anticipation, the build up to the explosion was because it was unsettling. Ridiculous. It yeah. was unsettling. We because we hadn't heard. It's, this is the end of season six, and we've never heard them use piano. Yeah. So as soon as I started hearing piano, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> what is happening? And the song was just so unsettling. And, and, and it was it was really fun, honestly. And yeah. I mean, when it even comes to the ideas, like there is this scene in, in I believe it is season six, episode three, um, where John says his watch is ended and he kills the guys. He executes the guys that killed him, yeah. Yeah. right? Which is such a weird sentence to say. <laughs> but... <laughs> He kills the guys that killed him. Um, and while he's doing that, you know, he's thinking like, okay, should I do this? Should I not do this? And he realizes that he has to do it. And yep. it has to, he realizes it has to be done and that he has to be the one who does it. Yep. And he turns around, he turns away from there for a moment. And then you can kind of see like this fire in his eyes light up. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and you can see just the rage building up. And when you go watch that scene now, you're actually hearing the Targaryen theme under there, like mm-hmm. very, very low. Mm-hmm. Like, so from that point, they've been telling you, like, this is season six, episode three. We don't actually get a chance to know anything about Jon Snow's birth until the end of season six. And we don't really see anything about who his true parents are to the end of season seven. Mm -hmm. But you can see they've been building this idea that something is different about this guy, more different than we know he's different. Yeah. From the beginning beginning of of season six. And that's, that's so fun, honestly. Yeah. Like that is that is such a, a great thing. So yeah, I'm really glad that Ramin is here. Ramin should never leave. He actually released um a single. Um they released a single um called The Prince That Was Promised, which I think is one of the main tracks um from last night's episode. Yeah. Um I don't know if they're gonna have more collaborations. I know in season eight they they brought to life the song about Jenny of Old Stones. Oh, that was a really and, good um, one. That was a really good that, one. That was that was I great. Like that. And I they had Podrick singing the song, which was cool. I mean, George R. R. Martin wrote these words of the song, but having having Ramin and all these people like come Ramin in and life. actually give the song some no, melody, was that beautiful. was great. I mean, the showrunners, um, Brian Cogman and Benioff and Weiss actually even wrote a new verse. And it was really great to hear that. And then they did, they, they released a version on um, on streaming platforms and well, anywhere that you listen, where Florence and the Machine are actually um, yeah, yeah. performing the song. So I don't know if we'll see more things like that, but but yeah, I'm glad that Ramin is around, yeah, and um, I'm looking forward to the new themes. And yeah, yeah, it's just I love yeah. them. I love them. He did. He was also in Succession. He was like he's done some video games, Gears of War. I don't know if you ever played those series. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He is a good at whatever. I'm not gonna fanboy about him. I'm definitely not gonna buy the, the ticket to a concert of his recently. I'll go watch it. <laughs> just he's too good 
Wow. The music is like, because it's, yeah, it's like you can, I can hear some songs and I can just see the scenes playing out in front of me, you know. Literally, like, yeah. I, I really love how, like, those ideas merge. I mean, I was actually listening, <laughs> I was listening to some of it the other day. And somebody came in that was like, what are you listening to? I was like, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm, I'm enjoying myself here. Yeah, I'm um, having a good time. I mean, it's, it's, it's really cool that, like, all these elements in our own real world can, you know, can bring this this other world to life and, you know, create something that feels believable. Yeah. Um, I like that the actors are so good. I'm really looking forward to more of these performances, especially um, the girl who's playing um young Rhaenyra, Millie Alcock, I think is her name. Yeah. I'm looking forward to um, more of Millie's performance because I'm really enjoying that. I like how she brings Rhaenyra to life. And I want to see how they transition that into Emma Darcy because um that person is going to have um an interesting take on power, an interesting take on Damon's role in the family. Yeah. Um and that's as much as I can say really. But um uh, there's like, well, there's there's really one person, or one other person in this conversation who knows exactly what I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, she she is. I mean, Emma Darcy is non-binary, which um, you know, it's it, it's cool to see um some diversity, not just in terms of race. I mean, again, shout out to the Valerians. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing more of them. Um, but but yeah, I'm I don't know. I guess. I guess it's good to see people who would normally um, not get certain roles kind of be getting them, yeah. and um, and I, I I'm also as far as the Valerians are concerned, very interested. Let me put it this way: I'm I'm very like if there's a chance to see rich black people, I'm probably there. <laughs> so so I'm I'm glad that that we can that we can get some more of that. Yeah. All right, we're over an hour now. Back to since that shouting at us. <laughs> Um, I guess my final thought about, you know, the whole show is that I feel like, so obviously when you're thinking about House of Dragons, Game of Thrones is going to come to mind, but I think it's important mm-hmm. to kind of enjoy the two of them separately. I hope, I like, I like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a opposed to the occasional call in to like, you know, the Game of Thrones just for, you know, this fan service, right? But I feel like they shouldn't do it too much. I feel like they should be a separate story, you know, treated separately, you know, because it's a different Let the show be dynamics. independent. Exactly. Exactly. Let the show be, the, be independent. And at the end, you can do, like, tie-ins, kind of like how Better Call Saul occasionally had tie-ins to the Breaking Bad universe, you know, story, not universe. Yes. Um, but, yeah, I'm very excited by this world set up. It's, um, to be honest, I had been, like, not really looking forward to it. I was like, yeah, I was just, I realized I was, was a disappointment from the previous, um, the ending of the, of the of the Game of Thrones. But when the you know the intro started i just i was so hyped it came out of nowhere I, I, it surprised me like i was like wow okay we're getting more of this let's go yeah so, yeah so yeah i'm very it's, excited it's for smart. this world that's being created by um you know and it's you know unlike game of thrones you know the fire and blood book which i i did my homework my book is right next to me i was reading it just to make sure i remembered everything um, the story <laughs> is already finished so you know if you're interested in the books and I say everyone should pick up one of the books and read unlike the Game of Thrones which has five out of seven books out right now this is just one book so you can read it and you know maybe after the show ends before the show ends and you can get your own opinion on it you know George doesn't pay me to promote his book I swear but um, you yeah. should read the book um, and in, unlike Game of Thrones this story is ended so you know it's not there is a lot more material for the show on us to pull from regarding the books. And we don't have to worry about them making stuff up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they can, they can spice, throw in a little bit of spice here and there, but they don't need to like make entire things up, you know, like, yeah, <sighs> I'm not triggered by, by, by season eight, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you have any final that thoughts is... on uh, House of the Dragon? Book? Yeah. Yeah, just that I'm 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 really looking forward to how things go. I mean, I first read um The Princess and the Queen slash the Blacks and the Greens like eight years ago. Yeah. And, you know, I have Fire and Blood too. I love using it as a reference for things. Um I haven't finished it and I think I'm definitely going to going to and like you said, everybody should read the book. I'm but I'm I'm actually looking forward to interesting surprises. Things that maybe I've forgotten, some slight details I may have forgotten. See how they I want to see how they do certain things. I'm I'm actually I would encourage them to, you know, like you said, spice things up. Like it's an adaptation for a reason. Like people who are always mad that certain things aren't the way they were in the book always confuse me. Yeah. Because like, I don't know, then why are you here? Like that version you're talking about, 
it you is, have it. It's yeah. in the book you read. Yeah. <laughs> Go read it. <laughs> yeah. But if you're going to come here, then have an open mind about what's what what's what's going on. And I mean, speaking of books, people actually even got mad at George R. R. Martin for writing Fire and Blood because, you know, Game of Thrones, the first book in Game of Thrones and Game of Thrones that was, um, that came out in nineteen ninety six. Then yeah. book two, A Storm of Swords, was ninety eight. Book three, right? um, um, I think it was old. No book two. Old. No no book two. Book two was Clash of Kings, and that was yeah. nineteen ninety eight. Book three was yeah. Storm of Swords. That was 2000. Peace for Crows book four was 2005. And then The Dance with Dragons, which is different from The Dance of the Dragons, but A Dance with the Dragons book five happens in, um, th- well, that, that came out in 2011, which is the year that Game of Thrones started as a show. And book six and seven have, this man, like, yeah. look at that schedule. And then all of a sudden, he just doesn't release any books yeah. for like 11 years. Yeah, and then I, in the middle of that, people think he's releasing something and then he comes out with fire and blood. Yeah, People like us were happy, but there were some people who were very oh, mad. I wasn't happy. like, yo, what are you doing? I wasn't happy. <laughs> I was irritated. I bought the book and I read it, but I was irritated. I'm like, dude, like, Jon Snow has been stabbed lying in snow and he whispered ghost for Literally, years. Like, for years. For years. A whole decade. His last word was ghost and the show did nothing with that with because that. they didn't know what to do with that. Yes. They didn't know. <laughs> I don't even blame them. I know what to do. Just let, let me write for you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gosh, but no, it's um, it's hopefully it I, comes out soon. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, I know I, he's been working on it, so I have a monthly alert usually for I Google it once a month. <laughs> the winds of winter. Are you for real? I shit you not. <laughs> Ever since after season six, he promised us that it will come out before season six of the show comes out. What I, I mean, I'm trying not, not to like, like drop this book now, but I'm like, how can you think you'll be done in 2016 and with 2022 and you're not done? Like, did you not know what? Like, the math yeah. is in math. Yeah, man, it's not, to not him, at all. Like, I'm not even being, I'm like, I'm being mid, uh, whatever, but like, it's not real. Like, take your time, write your book, and bring out the best version of, you know, whatever um, you're working on. And as mm-hmm. the fans will be here waiting, you know, for it to Yeah, happen. we shall see. We shall see. But yeah. yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it from us today. Um, thank you for everyone who's been listening up until this point. Remember yeah. to um to share the podcast um with anybody that you know would be interested in it or people who you think could be interested in it engage with the posts on social media um of course let us know what you think um we're going to be here for the long haul so um hopefully you're not tired of us after today because um, there's really not much there's there's really not much you can do about that yeah so so yeah that's um, that's it from us yeah. And um, check out everything that Popcorn for Dinner um, is working on other than this show. Um, there's still going to be coverage of industry. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot more stuff coming up as well. So stay yep. tuned. And if the Breaking Bad series also just wrapped up maybe last week. So, you know, if you are, sorry, not Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. So if you're the into Better Breaking Saul, Bad, yeah. Better Call Saul, I think it's a beautiful recap. Um, points were made. You know about how beautiful. Yeah, that points show are made. Is. I I did my best to make points. I mean, I'm actually <laughs> starting to, now that I'm thinking about it, there may be some people who are actually tired of me because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, here. But but yeah, go check that out. Um, again, let us know what you think, and yeah, see you next time. All right.